بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد Today is the last درس from the دروس that we've been given concerning the deviant group of الانحراف the خوارج and for the most part إخواني a lot can be said about the خوارج and I hope that you go back and you do your own reading and your own research and I think there are quite a few people who are here who didn't hear anything new about what we brought to the table in the last two days because you've been exposed to these ahadith and these incidents that have happened historically in al-Islam. So today, inshallah ta'ala, without drawing out the issue longer than what it needs to be drawn out, we just want to give you two wasiyas. Wasiyatain, nasihatain. Two advices from the many advices that we can give that come as a result of the ahdath of what happened with the khawarij. If you want to be protected from inculcating and having within yourself characteristics of the khawarij, and if you want to protect your children from the khawarij, and if you want to be an individual who is on a path that's different from their way, then there are some lessons that come from what happened with the khawarij. And these lessons are not peculiar just to the khawarij. They're peculiar to all of the groups that claim the haq is with them and that claim that what they're doing is the right thing. We're living in the time of fitna, and this is the time of al-mihn. It's the zaman of al-fitn, and the ayam of al-mihn. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, as we mentioned yesterday, he told us about these times. The individual, he can navigate through these times and things can be crystal clear for him. They can be crystal clear because he has knowledge of the situation. He read the Quran, he read the Sunnah. So when he sees a situation and is exposed and introduced to him, he sees it for its reality. As for the individual who may not have read, he didn't read, so he doesn't have information. He also can have clarity. But the way he gets clarity is by being from those people who worship Allah Azza wa Jal. By making jihad, trying to be from the awliya of Allah. Because if Allah Azza wa Jal takes a person as a friend, if Allah Azza wa Jal chooses an individual because that person is making a lot of ijtihad and worshiping Allah the right way, then Allah becomes the eyes by which he sees. Allah becomes the ears by which he hears. Allah becomes the hand by which he strikes. And he becomes the feet by which he walks with. So something appears to him. He doesn't have knowledge necessarily. But because he is from the people who have ikhlas, his aqid is correct. He's a person on the sunnah. He has al-ittiba and al-i'tisam. And he himself is making efforts to make the sunnah prayers and to fast and so forth and so on. She doesn't have a lot of knowledge. She, has, she, does, she doesn't have much knowledge at all. But she'll get up and she'll pray two rakat for qiyam al-layl, four rakat for qiyam al-layl. And as a result of that, Allah shows these individuals the realities of situation. And, and, and when I mention that, I'm not talking about Sufi kalam, about al-kashif and things like that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about divine protection from Allah because the individual he made efforts to safeguard his religion. So these two advices, they come from what happened in the history of the Khawarij. The first we'll see uh, that I want to give to you is the Muslim cannot be deceived. Don't allow yourself to be easily deceived. Listen to this very carefully. Don't allow yourself to be tricked easily. Don't just listen to what people are saying. And don't just look the way something appears. You have to weigh the situation. There's a brother, I think he's in the masjid right now. I met him in the hotel. He comes from India. He's working with some company here, Metro, the Metro. And I met him. I saw him early. He was looking at me, but we met. And he said he was coming to the masjid. We brought him to the masjid. I have husnadhan about him. I don't know him. I have husnadhan. So I brought him to the masjid, introduced him to one of the people responsible for the masjid. 
But if he were to ask me, can I borrow a thousand dollars? I'm going to say, I don't know you. I don't know if I'm going to get my money back. So I'm not going to loan you that thousand dollars until I get to know you. Umar radiallahu anhu in his khilafa, in his khilafa, the man said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, you see that man over there? He's a good man. Put him in your, in, your, in your office. Let him have a job. Let him do something. Give him some responsibility. Umar said, Do you know him? He said, Yes, I know him. Umar said, Did you travel with him? He said, No. Did you sleep with him? He said, No. Did you eat with him? He said, No. Did you do business with him? He said, No. He said, Wallahi, you don't know that man. Maybe you saw him in the masjid go up and down and make sajda, but you don't know that man. And we don't want some person to come and say, you see, Rama said, did you sleep with him? There's homosexuality in Islam. He didn't mean that. What he meant by that is if you travel with the person, you travel with them, they call traveling a safar in Islam in Arabic, a safar, which means to expose. Traveling will expose a person's reality. Does he have patience? Is he a person who has anger management issues? Is he self-centered? When you travel with him and an individual goes to sleep, he may start saying things in his sleep that he's not responsible for because his subconscious is letting out his secrets about himself. That's the meaning of the statement of Umar. So the point is, you don't know that man. You want to marry him? He wants to marry your daughter? Take your time. He wants to borrow your money? Take your time. Why? Because we have su'adhan? No. Because the Prophet told us about this time that we're living in, sallallahu alayhi wa Like I told you before, people don't know salat, people don't know zakat, people don't know hajj, during this time. Muslims don't know their religion. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, sata'ti ala nas sanawatun khadda'at. There are some years that are going to come that are the years of deceit. They're the years of deceit. يُكَذَّبُوا فِيهَا الصَّادِقِ وَيُصَدُّقُوا فِيهَا الْكَاذِقِ During those years, the truthful person won't be believed. He's a scholar. He has ikhlas. He knows what he's talking about. But the people will say, he's a scholar for dollars. He doesn't know what he's talking about because he's not saying what they want him to say. And then the one who was a kadab is the one the people will believe. That's what the Nabi said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He's using weak hadith, left, right, and center. He said, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you don't know a man until you traveled with him, until you ate with him, until you did business with him, until you, and, and, and until you uh, slept with him. Prophet didn't say that. Umar said that. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, radiallahu anhu. So his kalam is weak hadith, weak hadith. But the people believe it. All of his lessons is from the book, Fadail Al-A'mal. Weak hadith, weak hadith. But the people sit there and he reads that weak hadith. And the person says, Allah, Allah. And he said about the times that we're living in, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you tamanu fiha al khain. Wa you khawanu fiha al amin. During these deceitful years, the individual who is not trustworthy, he's the one that people are gonna give him the money. We're gonna give you the money, hold the money. And he's gonna steal the money. He's the one you're gonna give him to your daughter. You're gonna give the daughter to him. He's supposed to be trustworthy. He ain't trustworthy. And the one who is trustworthy, the people won't trust him. And then the last part of the hadith, connected to what we're dealing with. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, وَيَنْتِقُ فِيهَا الرُّوَيْبِدَ قِيلَ وَمَنْ رُوَيْبِدَ تُوْ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ قَالْ الرَّجُلُ التَّافِهُ يَتَكَلَّمُ فِي أَمْرُ الْعَامَّةِ During those years of deceit, the ignoble man will speak. The one who's not competent, he's not qualified. He's the one who's going to speak. And he used the word ar-ruwaybida. The prophet, the companion said, who is the ruwaybida? What does that mean? Showing his level of Arabic was higher than theirs. What is the ruwaybida? They're Arabs. I didn't know what the meaning of the word. He said the ruwaybida is the ignoble man who's ignorant, talking about the affairs of the people. Who are you? You don't know your religion. You, you, you don't know your religion and you're talking about a jarhwa ta'deel. And you're talking about, he's a kafir, this is jihad, this is khilafa, he's this, he's that. Who, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? 
Some of the people today, Ikhwani, from the youth, from the youth. A man just came just now, Wallahi, came. His father's on life support. This is real life. This is not the TV land. Real life. After Salada, come here. The man, his father's on life support system for the last month. He wants to know, can I pull the plug? Can I pull the plug? He asked the imam. I came up. The imam said, ask, ask, ask Abu Usama. I know what he was doing. When I heard the question, I realized what he, why he said it. You see, every day I come up here, I'm sweating. Every day I come up, my hat almost popped off my head. You want me to tell you to pull a plug on your father? That's something that Umar anhu would have gathered the shiyukh of Badr on and for. But the young people today say, pull a plug. The other one said, don't pull a plug. As long as his heart is beating, don't pull. Who are you? And why do you feel responsible for that? That's a big issue. The issue of the people's blood, the issue of the people's private parts becoming halal and haram. Halal and haram. We have some young people saying, ma malakat al-ayman, what the right hand possess. In al-Islam, we have that thing. You make jihad, we could take the prisoners of war. So the lady is your property. Maria, Maria, the mother of Ibrahim, she wasn't the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. By the Lord of the Kaaba, she was a gift given to him by the king of Egypt. He gave the Prophet that lady and gave the Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam al bagal And the Nabi, he made a stimta with that lady and a baby came out of that, Ibrahim. So she's his ummu walid. We don't have to apologize and make her his wife. The ummu walid. People come today and say, this is a delil. We can go and have girlfriends because Toronto is Darul Harb. Darul Harb. Yahi. Umar, Umar, Umar. He would gather the people of Badr and then he would put the issue to the people of Badr. He would say, hey, Uthman, what do you think? Uthman would say, Allahu Alam. Ali, what do you think? And Ali, I didn't mention to you the other day. The Prophet said about Ali ibn Abi Talib, Radiallahu anhu wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Aliyu Aliyu Aqda ummati He's the biggest qadi of our ummah That's from his virtues Ali what do you think? Ali said Allahu alam Abdurrahman ibn Awf What do you think? Allahu alam Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas What do you think? Allahu alam All the way around Until it went back to Umar radiallahu anhu And here we come and we just say something So from the nasiha, be careful and beware of the kalimat al-lafatat. You know those, those gleaming words. Al-jihad, al-jihad, al-khilaf, al-khilafa. This was the way of the khawarij. They had nice speech. And the speech alone is not enough. The Arab spring, the Arab spring. How in the world does this ummah allow itself to call that folder the Arab Spring. The Arabs have gone backwards because of that. They've gone backwards. Our Ummah went backwards because of that. When did our religion allow that kind of folder? When? When? Democracy. Democracy. When the, when the, when the Khawarij came, they said, أَنَ hukum illa lillah. We only want the judgment to be by, with Allah, by Allah, by the Quran, by the Sunnah. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, Kalimatul Haqq, Urid biha al Batil. What you're saying is true, but what you want with it is falsehood. It's not true. It's not really true. It's a good word. I told you, the halakat in the masjid, over there, over there, over there, over there. Take 100 pebbles. Say, SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Say that, say that, say that. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud came and said, Hey, people. You're doing an innovation. This is not from the religion, what you're doing. Not from the deen. They said, but Abu Abdurrahman, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, we only want it good. We only want it the dhikr of Allah. We only want good. Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, wa kam min maridin al khayr lam yudrikhu. How many people want to do good, but they don't get it because they didn't do it the right way. That word, we only want good, it's not enough. 
Don't fall for the glimmering kalimat of the people. The sunnah, the sunnah, the sunnah, salafiyya, salafiyya. But the sunnah that they're calling to and the salafiyya that they're calling to is dividing the ummah unnecessarily. Warning against people unnecessarily. Don't get duped in this time. Don't get duped. And the story of the Khawarij that I shared with you, I told you, I told you. The slave of Abdullah ibn Abi Awfa radiallahu anhu, he called what he was doing his khuruj. He called it hijra. Nice word, hijra. It's from Islam. Nice word. But that's not hijra. Uthman ibn Affan, the Khawarij went against him. Uthman ibn Affan. Uthman is religious. They thought Uthman was irreligious. And they thought that they were the religious ones. Now there is a big benefit that we get in Al-Islam from the Munafiqeen being in our Ummah. The history of the Munafiqeen and their story in the Quran proves this point right here. Don't be tricked and duped by the statements of the people and what you see. You have to take your time. That's what intelligent people do. You're a businessman in your business. Someone comes and works for you. You're going to take your time and you're going to weigh him. You're not going to hire him just like that. Allah said about the munafiqeen. That ayat is telling us, look, those munafiqeen, they come and they swear. They say, Ya Muhammad, we swear, you're the Rasul of Allah. Wallahi, you're the Rasul of Allah. Allah said, Allah knows that you're the Rasul. Allah knows that. And Allah bears witness that these munafiqeen are liars. But that's their kalam. That's what they said. Allah said, Allah knows you're the Rasul. And Allah bears witness that they are, they are kalamas. They are liars. اتخذوا أيمانهم جنة They swear by Allah. Wallahi, 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 wallahi. And they only say wallahi to stop the people from the way of Allah. Wallahi, I did this. Wallahi, I did that. Wallahi, I need the money. Wallahi. And they're just lying. That ayat of the Quran is a lesson. It doesn't mean, ikhwani, and I'm not saying... We should, we should have su'adhan. I don't know you, you don't know me. I have to have husnadhan, you have to have husnadhan. But opening up your affairs, your secrets, opening up your house and your doors to people you don't know. Islam said, don't do that. During this day and age, the apparent of the words of the people is rahma, khair, islah, al-jihad, al-islam. Al Khilafa. He's a Zalim. We want a good Imam. All of that, all that. The Kalam in the, in the apparent is good. But inside of it, what you can't see, it's evil under that. So take your time because the time is going to unfold the reality. There is an issue that happened in Al Islam. Yarhamakullah. Allah Ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al Tawbah. وَالَّذِينَ اتَّخَذُوا مَسْجِدًا دِرَارًا وَكُفْرًا وَتَفْرِيقًا بَيْنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَإِرْصَادًا لِمَنْ حَارَبَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ مِنْ قَبْلِ There were some people who built a masjid and they called it Masjid Dirar, the Masjid of Hurt. The Nabi had his masjid in Al-Medina, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His masjid was in Al-Medina. It is the masjid that the Muslims need. They don't need any other masjid. The hypocrites, they didn't like what the prophet was doing. They didn't like his decisions. They didn't like that he would be raised up. They didn't like that this poor person would be raised up. They didn't like that the Nabi would make him the emir. 
They didn't like the decisions that the Prophet made, sallallahu alayhi wa So what did they do? They do what many people do today. We don't like what's going on in that masjid, so we're going to go off and break off and do another masjid. And it can be in the next street. So what they did, they went and they opened up a masjid close to that. Masjid is beautiful. We want to build a masjid. We want a masjid. That's beautiful. That kalam apparently is beautiful. But Allah described that masjid. He said in that masjid, it's the masjid in which they're trying to hurt the community. They're trying to spread kufr. They're trying to divide the community. And they're waging war against Allah and his messenger from that masjid. But the kalam masjid, masjid is beautiful, masjid. So the khawarij, they come in our countries and they say, those people, they're kuffar. They don't judge by what Allah revealed. And we want to judge by what Allah revealed. They don't have al-wala, they don't have al-bara to the kuffar. They're with America, they're with this, and we're going to be with the Muslims, and we this, and we're that. That's just kalam. Don't be tricked by the kalam. And that's what happened with the khawarij. Another issue, khwani, concerning this particular point with the khawarij, don't be tricked by what you see from people. Is that the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told his companions, his companions, tahkiruna salatukum ila salatihim, wa siyamukum ila siyamihim. When you, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, Abu Dhar al-Ghaffari, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As, that man was an abid. He used to fast the fast of Dawood. One day on, one day off. One day on, one day off. Before that, he used to read the Quran every night. The Nabi said, I heard you read the Quran every night. He said, yes. He said, don't do that. Read the Quran, read the Quran after, read the Quran after 10 days. Another hadith said, 20 days. Don't read the Quran like that. He said, I can do more. I can do more. All the way until the Prophet allowed him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to read the Quran in seven days or three days. And he used to fast Monday and Thursday. Every, he used to fast every, every day. The Prophet said, don't do that. Fast three times every month. He said, I can do more. He said, then don't fast more than the fast of Dawood. It's the best fast. One day on, one day off. One day on, one. And he did it. He wouldn't have relationships with his wife. His wife complained. She said, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As has no need for me. He's worshiping Abid, Zahid. That man, radiallahu anhu, when he came older, when he became older, his eyesight left. He was weak. He told his students from the tabi'in, I wish I would have listened to what the Prophet told me, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now this man, the Prophet told him, when you compare your salat to the khawarij, you're going to look at your salat as being insignificant. Your fast is insignificant. These people have ibadah. But that's not a sign that a man is the truth. That the man is on the truth. How big his beard is, how white his thobe is, it's not a sign. And Imam al-Shafi'i and many of the Somali people on the madhab of Imam al-Shafi'i and other than the Somalis. And his madhab, haqqan, if a person was on his madhab with knowledge and fairness and justice, he'll be okay as a systematic way to worship Allah. But, 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 iyaka, iyaka, and say that you say everything in that madhab is correct. And don't say it's wajib, lazim to have the madhab. If you don't, you're disobeying Allah. The one who says that he's speaking without knowledge. And Imam al-Shafi himself told the people, told the people, hey, if something comes to you from what I say and it's wrong, take the Quran and the Sunnah and leave what I said. Anyway, anyway. And Imam al-Shafi told the people, if you see a man, if you see a man walking on top of the water or flying in the sky, don't believe him until you take all of his deeds and his actions and you compare them to the Quran and the Sunnah. A Dajjal, when he comes, a Dajjal, when he comes, he's going to be able to take many people off of the Sirat al-Mustaqeem because Muslims, today, we are easily fooled. I'm not telling you to do this, Ikhwani, I'm not telling you to do this. But on the internet, there are some magicians. There's a magician, they call him Dynamo. They have him walking over the Thames River in London. Don't you believe Muslims believe that? 
They don't know that this man is just optic illusions and it's just them playing with, with, with the camera. Nobody walking over no water. They have the man walking up the side of a building. If you see someone walking up the side of a building, you have to say, that's a shaitan right there. That is a shaitan because the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't come with stuff like that. So don't believe, don't believe what people say, what people do until you judge what's being said, until you judge what they're doing with the kitab and the sunnah. It is not enough, the empty slogans, the empty slogans. So that is the first wasiya ikhwati fillah. The first wasiya. Advice. Take your time and judge what people are saying. It's not enough. We want to build a masjid. The masjid, nice kalam, nice kalam. But behind what they're saying and doing, are those four evil things. Why did Allah reveal that, that ayah to us in that incident? The second advice from the story of the Khawarij is again, during the time of Al-Fitna and the time of Al-Mihn, the time of problems, trials and tribulations in these years, stick to the scholars of Al-Islam. Stick to the scholars of Islam. I think I speak for all of us when I say not a single one of us feels that he is an alim in the religion of Al-Islam. I don't think anyone feels that about himself in this masjid. Some of us have other takhassus. Someone in here is a qualified and competent accountant and he knows what he's doing. Someone else knows computers. Another one is a good mechanic. Another one is a sparky, you know, electrician. But a scholar? I don't think anybody here thinks that he is a scholar. I don't think so. And what I mean a scholar, I'm not talking about. He gives a nice khutbah. That's not a scholar. Everyone who gives a nice talk is not a scholar. Or he graduated from a university in Dioband or other than that, or Medina or Mecca. That doesn't make you a scholar. And this is one of the problems with our culture. If someone graduates from the university, he becomes an alim or an alima. When I became a Muslim, I went with a group of Muslims. They call themselves Jamatu Tablih. Jamatu Tablih. They are brothers who have sincerity, I believe. I was a brand spanking new Muslim. After three weeks, they told me, get up and talk. I said, talk about what? They said, it will come to you. <laughs> Khwani, I'm not saying that to make you laugh about those brothers or at those brothers. That's a sign and indication. Something's wrong with that. The Rasul of Al-Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he conquered Medina and he was in a position of authority. What did he do? He sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Al-Yemen. He said, Ya Mu'adh, you're about to go to people from Al-Kitab. Make the very first thing you call them to, La ilaha illallah. Very first thing to the Shahadatin. If they accept that, let them know they have to pray. They accept that, they have to do zakat and stay away from the best money of theirs. Mu'adh ibn Jabal, Yom al Qiyamah, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Mu'adh ibn Jabal will come with a flag, a raya, Yom al Qiyamah. He'll be in front of all of the ulama of the dunya from Beni Adam. From Adam all the way to the last human being. Every scholar, other than, other than, other than, the prophets and the messengers, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim, Mu'adh ibn Jabal is going to be the imam of the ulama. That's who the prophet sent to al-Yemen. The prophet sent after Mu'adh, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, from the ulama of the companions, to go and help Mu'adh. After that, he sent Ali ibn Abi Talib, with those two, to go and teach the people. He didn't send that Bedouin who urinated in the masjid, Radiallahu anhu, the Bedouin was jahil. Radiallahu anhu about the religion. He wasn't knowledgeable about the religion. He sent ulama for da'wah ila Allah. Ulama. So the point here is sticking to the scholars, sticking to the scholars in the time of fitna. And that's what happened. When the man from Egypt came and he was criticizing Uthman ibn Affan, Uthman, he didn't participate. In the battle of Badr. He wasn't there. Uthman in the battle of Uhud, 
He ran away from the battlefield and he was afraid. Uthman, he wasn't there at the Bayat al Radwan. That's what the Kharij people, the Khwarij were saying. But then he saw a group of people sitting. He said, Who are those people? They said, That's Quraysh. Who's that man they're all surrounding? They said, That's Abdullah ibn Umar. He went to Abdullah ibn Umar, one of the ulama of the companions. Ya Abdullah ibn Umar, I want to ask you something about Uthman ibn Affan. He did this, he didn't do that, he did that. Abdullah ibn Umar knew where he was coming from. Abdullah ibn Umar knew he was from the Khawarij. He said, listen, 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 relax. Let me explain to you. And then Abdullah ibn Umar told him the Makharij of what he's talking about. He sees Uthman as evil and the actions of Uthman as evil. The scholar sees what Uthman does as the Mahasin, from the Mahasin of Uthman. The scholar sees it different. Abdullah ibn Abi Ofa, he saw his hijra with Rasulullah as ibadah. And he saw what his gulam was doing as ma'asiyah. Kharuj. Khwani, I'm going to give you right now, inshallah, an example to help you, I hope, to always remember the position of the ulama in al-Islam. But before that, this is really important. Look, it's nighttime right now. Nighttime. This book. The Quran, I'm going to put it right here. The Quran. When I tell you to connect yourselves to the ulama, that doesn't mean to blindly follow the ulama. Not an Imam Abu Hanifa, not an Imam Malik, not an Imam Shafi, not an Imam Ahmed. Don't blindly follow. If you have the ability to understand something and the heart comes to you, take it. If you don't have the ability, then blindly follow and don't talk. Don't talk. Because the one who makes taqlid is jahil. He takes someone's position and opinion and he doesn't know his dalil. So don't argue. Just be quiet. If you feel he's this or that, take that position because you're muqallid, but not kill him. This is the Quran. The ulama, the ulama. If we turn these lights off, if we turn these lights off, we can't read the Quran. If we turn the lights off, we can't read the Quran. We're in pitch blackness and darkness. We can't read it. When we turn the lights on, we can read the Quran. The ulama are like the lights. The ulama are not the Quran. The ulama are not the goal and the objective. They are the wasila. They help us to understand. They help us. They are not the goal and the objective. Some of the Muslims, they've made the ulama the goal and the objective. The delil comes to you, Ya Abdullah, that the Prophet said this, he said, don't do that, he did it this way, and you say, but my imam, but my imam. But your imam said, Abu Hanifa, and Imam Abu Hanifa said, إِذَا صَحَّ الْحَدِيثِ فَهُوَ مَذْهَبِ If the hadith is authentic, then that's my madhhab. That was their religion. And don't sit there and think that I, 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 revert to the religion, I think I'm better than Al Imam Abu Hanifa. Hey, hat, I don't think that. But I know one thing, and I'm going to ask you this, this is question. And don't be shy. One question. Who is the only human being who is ma'asum in our religion? The only human being. Who is he? Who is he? Hey, you guys, some of you look like you're shy to answer. Who's the only human being who is ma'asum in this religion? The Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr is not ma'asum. Umar is not ma'asob. All of the sunnah didn't hit Abu Bakr Umar. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari came to the house of Umar, who the Prophet said, Lo kana nabiyyin ba'di la kana Umar. Lo saraka Umar maslakan aw fajjan. La saraka shaytan maslakan aw fajjan ghayra maslakihi. If Umar goes down the street, shaytan gonna choose another street. He had knowledge. He went to the house of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and knocked on the door three times. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari went to the house of Umar, the Amir al muminin He knocked. Knocked the second time. Knocked the third time. No one answered. He left. Umar looked out the window and he saw Abu Musa al-Ash'ari going down. He saw him later on. You came to my house, you knocked and then you left. Why didn't you stay there? I came to open the door, but you had left. He said, I heard the Prophet say, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari said, I heard the Prophet say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
إذا استأذن أحدكم ثلاثة ولن يؤذن له فلينصرف. Anyone who knocks three times is not given permission to come in, then go away. Don't stand here knocking, knocking. Umar said, I never heard that hadith. I never heard that hadith. And how many hadith did we hear the Prophet say things like, I came, Abu Bakr and Umar came. I went, Abu Bakr and Umar went. I believe, Abu Bakr and Umar believe. Abu Bakr came in, and then Umar came in, and then Uthman came in, and the Prophet sat up. Always we hear Abu Bakr and Umar, Abu Bakr and Umar. And Umar didn't know that simple, easy hadith. Ma Ahmad bi al balwa. Every day people are knocking on the door. Umar said to him, if you don't bring someone to collaborate what you're saying, I'm going to deal with you. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari was a scholar from the companions. But Umar said, if you spread these weak hadith, Prophet Muhammad said this, said that, and you don't deal and you don't prove it, I'm going to deal with you. Wallahi, if Umar was here today to see how many people say, Qala Rasulullah, Qala Rasulullah, and it's just Kevin. When he went to the masjid, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, he said to the Ansar, anybody heard this hadith? They said, yes, why? He said, I went to the house of the Amir al-Mu'mineen and this happened, that happened. They started laughing. They said, we all heard that hadith. We're going to sin with you, Abu Sa'id al-Khudri, the youngest one from amongst us, is going to go with you to the Amir al-Mu'mineen. So the point is, how did that sunnah pass by Umar? It passed him by because there's no human being who knows every sunnah. So the point here is, during the time of the fitna, we have to be with the scholars. Not because the scholars are the goal and the objective. The scholars are the anwar. The anwar that help us to read. They help us to understand. So the point that I want to share with you, the benefit of the scholar. It's practical. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prayed two rakats in his house for Salatul Fajr. And his wife, Juwairiyah, was also praying her salat. He finished his sunnah and he got up to go to the masjid to leave the community in salat. She finished her sunnah and he saw her sitting there about to pray again and he left. She said that he came back at salat al-duha time, duha, salat in this masjid. 6.15. Now, duha time, 11 o'clock today, 11.30. The prophet left, 6 o'clock, 6.15. He came back, 11.30. The lady was still sitting in the same position. The prophet said to her, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what have you been doing since I left? Have you been in this space? She said, yes, I've been right here. Doing what? She said, making the dhikr of Allah with my fingers, not with rocks, not with the tasbih, not with anything. You know the thing that you, how many laps you did. Not just with the fingers. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I know a dua. If you say it three times, it would be better and more than what you've said all of this time. Now you have to understand, this lady is an Arab. She's not an ajami. She's going to come with some khurafat and bida and kalimat and shirkiyat. She's not going to. She's gonna, she has Tawheed. She's the wife of the Nabi. Whatever dhikr she was making, she is from the Quran and the Sunnah. It's not some craziness. People give you the dhikr. I want to get married, Sheikh. I want to get married. Okay, you didn't get married yet? How old are you? I'm 35. Oh, 40? You're old. Okay. Just sit down and just say 1,000 times, Ya Wajid, Ya Wajid, Ya Wajid, Ya Wajid. And that's going to help you to get married? How do you believe that stuff? Some of you look really mean. Relax, Ikhwani. Relax. Some of you look really mean. <laughs> Upset. Upset at what? Khair, inshallah. She was making dua of the sunnah, tawheed. The Nabi said, if you say three times, three times, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, adada khalqihi, wa rida nafsihi, wa zinata arshihi, wa midada kalimatihi. If you say that three times, it would be better than what you did from 6 o'clock to 11.30. 
it takes less than 30 seconds to say, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, adada khalqihi, wa rida nafsihi, wa zinata arshi, wa midada kalimati. Say that three times, and it's from the adhkar of the sabah. Say that three times, and it's better than what you've done. So one of the benefits of the hadith is, you can say that in the morning. And that hadith is important, we don't have time to explain it. But the benefit is what? The student, radiallahu anha, she was making a lot of efforts. She wasn't disobeying Allah, doing innovation and shirk. She was making a lot of efforts. That are mashkura. But the scholar, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, taught her how to maximize her effort and minimize the energy. The scholar, he sees what you don't see. He has the ability, not from al-kashf, but from al-ilm wal basira That's the nur of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Someone's living with the Qur'an and the Sunnah. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, just as an example, he said about Jibreel. La yazal Jibreel yusini bijjar hatta dhanantuhu sayuwarrithuhu sayuwarrithuhu He said, Jibreel used to come to me and he kept telling me about the neighbor. Ya Muhammad, the neighbor. Ya Muhammad, the neighbor. Remember the neighbor. Ya Muhammad, the neighbor. Did you visit the neighbor? Ya Muhammad, how's your neighbor? Ya Muhammad, do good to the neighbor. He said he kept doing that. Kept, he said until I thought that the neighbor would be allowed to inherit. Why did he think that? Because the farasa of the Nabi, his fiqh, his fahim, he says to himself, Jabril won't keep coming to me like that unless this neighbor has some special place. He's close, like my mother, my father. If I die, my wife, my children, my mother, my father, they're going to inherit. That neighbor is close. So the farasa, the fam, the fiqh of the Nabi living with the Quran made him think that neighbor is going to be able to get the mirath. That's how it is with the ulama of al-Islam. They're teaching this religion. Allah said, the Prophet said, and they're going, that's their lives, in and out. That's their lives. When you come to them, they see the fitna before it even comes. They say, don't do that. Don't rebel against Qaddafi right now. Don't do that. They see it before it comes. Nobody else sees it. The regular people, they see it when it's going away. And it's too late now. We see it after the fact. Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَإِذَا جَاءَهُمْ أَمْرٌ مِّنَ الْأَمْنِ أَوَ الْخَوْفِ the munafiqeen, the hypocrites. Anytime something happens touching the community, public safety or fear, the munafiqeen, they spread it, they start talking about it. They watch Al Jazeera, they give their opinions. They're in the place where we drink kahwa, where we drink shai, where we eat khat. We just, they just give their opinions. This, that, this, that. They don't have any knowledge. That's the munafiqeen. They just spread it. Just kalam, just kalam, just kalam. Allah said, if they would have only referred it back to the Rasul and to those who have been given knowledge, then they would have explained to them the best situation for it. But if it wasn't for the rahmah of Allah and his father, most of you would have followed the shaitan, except a few. Except a few. Who are the few? The few who sit at the knees of the ulama. And today, ikhwani, today, listen, listen. Today, with this internet, with this internet, we have access to ulama, real scholars. You have access to people who know this religion. And I'm not of those people who believe the ulama are only in Saudi Arabia. Don't be of that understanding. There are ulama in Yemen, ulama in Saudi Arabia, ulama in Syria, ulama in Somalia, ulama in Afghanistan. But which ulama am I talking about? I'm not talking about the Adam and Sue, the bad scholar. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the scholar of the Sunnah, the one who's going to connect the hearts and the minds of the people to the Kitab and the Sunnah. And if he's on the madhab, he'll teach the madhab. But when the madhab is wrong, he'll say, look, 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 look. Our madhab here, roughly a day, not doing it. Our madhab is wrong. Our imam, Imam Abu Hanifa, 
he was disagreed with by Abu Yusuf here, by Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani here, by Zafar here. He was disagreed. They disagree with him. So if they can disagree, you can disagree because Allah Azza wa made us responsible to follow the Nabi. And all of the madhabs are like that. And Imam Malik, he made a mistake here. And Imam al-Shaf made a mistake here. And the goal and the objective, ikhwani, here is not to put down those imams. Because wallahi, if there was a qualified, bona fide Hanafi madhab, Shafi madhab, Maliki madhab, where I'm coming from, I would learn that madhab from him if he knew what he was doing. As for the guys that's growing up, that's the madhab and the religion of his people. You could take that with a grain of salt or leave it. So in closing out this last issue, those two wasiyas, two wasiyas, be careful, be weary of the glittering slogans. Al-Jihad, Al-Jihad, the Khilafa, the Khilafa, those people, the Kuffar, and we're not, we're the Muttaqeen, and we want it. Don't, don't, be, beware of that. Look at what people are saying. You may not have the ability to judge, so now that takes us back to what? That takes us back to the importance of always being connected to the ulama of Islam, but especially in the days of fitna and al-mihn. Fitna, trials and tribulations. And try to be of those people who get knowledge. Be of the people who are trying to learn your religion, all of us, to the best of our ability, and engage yourself in the ibadah. During the time of the fitna, I told you, the Nabi, he told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-ibadah to fil harj kahijratin ilayya. Anyone who engages himself and he makes a lot of ibadah during the times of fitna, it will be like the one who makes hijra to me. Why did he say that? Because during the time of the fitna, during the time of the fitna, the one who is sitting is better than the one who is standing up. And the one who is lying down is better than the one who is sitting down. The more people are involved in the fitna, the more complicated it's going to be. It's going to be complicated. Ali ibn Abi Talib said, knowledge, knowledge. It was just a nukta. It used to just be a dot, knowledge. The Allah would say this, the Prophet would say that, and they would do it. He said, now knowledge, knowledge has become very wide and expansive because people who don't deserve to be involved in it got involved in it. So now the dot needs an explanation. The explanation of the dot needs an explanation. The explanation of the explanation of the dot needs an explanation. And on and on and on. Because so many people got involved who don't deserve to be involved. When Allah said in the Quran, Ar-Rahman, Al-Arshistawa, not a single companion said, how, when, where, Limada, not a single one. They just said, that's it. Not a single one. But the people came later and they started saying the Qadr. Allah doesn't know. Other people say Allah forced you. The Khawarij. They say he's a Kafir. He's it. Because people got involved who don't deserve to be involved. So this is what we wanted to present Khwani, concerning these three days. My goal and my objective here after the brothers chose this topic for me. And I don't have a problem with it. I see it as a form of jihad fi sabili la. To expose the people who have that corruption and that harm for this ummah. My goal and my objective here is not to like put down any group, any scholar, any madhab. I mentioned the Pakistanis. I don't want anybody leaving here saying, that guy's against Pakistan. I'm not against Pakistan at all, at all. We have an wala for Pakistan. It's a Muslim country, but we're against the shirk and the kufr and the zulm of the government and the people. The government and the people. We're against the ikhtilaf and the tafarruq of the government and the people. Same issue with Somalia, same issue with Syria, same issue with Egypt. We're not against the Muslim countries and the Muslims of Yemen. We're against the kufr, the shirk, the bid'a, the, the ikhtilaf, the tafarruq, all of these issues. That's what we're against. And all of us are making mistakes. But let us learn our religion, inshallah ta'ala, and come back to what the simple religion that the Prophet brought his companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa radiallahu anhum ajma'in. For the next five minutes, akhwani, five minutes, if you brothers have any questions concerning today's dars, we'll deal with that question. We want to apologize to the sisters. They sent questions at the end of each dars, so we never got it until the end, and that's why we didn't 
have the time to answer any of their questions. So if you brothers have any uh, taliqat or questions, you can put them forward now. Ahi. How do you know that someone is a scholar? Sometimes, Ikhwani, this is a reoccurring question. It's one of those questions that's a weird question in a way. Because sometimes a clear and easy thing, when you try to explain it, you just make it more confusing. The scholars are known because the other scholars identify them as scholars. Like Al-Imam Malik said. He said he didn't start to give fatwas until over 200 of the ulama of al Medina said, you're qualified, go ahead and do it. The great tabi'i, Ibrahim al nakhai who learned from Abdullah bin Mas'ud, and Ibrahim al nakhai taught Hamad ibn Abi Sulaiman, who taught Al-Imam Abu Hanifa. So Ibrahim al nakhai has something to do with the Hanafi Madhat. He said about how do you know it's a scholar? Kunna ida attain a rajul. Li na khudu minhu al ilm. La na khudu minhu hatta nandur. Ila salatihi wa samtihi. We used to, if we came to take knowledge from a man, we wouldn't take knowledge from him until we looked at how he prayed and how his guidance was. Did he drink with his left hand? Did he have isbal? Did he open his mouth? Did he speak and lie? Did he joke around? Did he play around? Did he say things that were not supported? They will look at his guidance. And before that, they wouldn't take any knowledge from him. They will look, how does he pray? Does he do rough early a day? Does he take a sutra? Is he looking around? The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Inna Akhtar Raju Sirkatan Aladi Yasruku Salatahu La Yatimu Raku Aha Wala Sajudaha. The biggest thief is the one who steals from his prayer. He doesn't do right Ruku, doesn't do right Sajda. He's moving real fast. If the man is supposed to be a scholar and he's teaching us and he's praying, stealing from Salat, he'll steal your money. He'll steal your money if he's stealing from Salah. He doesn't have al wara for the Salah. He's not. And the real scholar, Akhi, is the one who fears Allah. Inna yakhshallaha min ibadihi al The ones who really fear Allah from his servants are the ulama. Does he have the taqwa of Allah? When you ask the scholar, Akhi, my young brother, who came to me with that issue, qilu wa qal, al-jarh wa ta'deel, when you go to the ulama, as Sheikh Abdul Muhsin al Abad, Sheikh Salih al Fawzan, for an example, and you say, Sheikh, we have an Imam in our masjid, his name is Abdul Razak, Abdul Aziz. He did this, he did that, he said this, he said that. Sheikh, what should we do with him and about him? The Sheikh is going to say, leave that and get beneficial knowledge. Because he doesn't know Abdul Aziz, and he doesn't know you. And he doesn't know the details. So he knows as a scholar to open up the door and to say, warn against him. Do this, do that. It's irresponsible. It's irresponsible. So the scholar is like that. The competent, qualified scholar is the one who has the khashia of Allah and the khawf from Allah Azza So before finishing that question, ikhwani fillah, make a distinction. As our mother said, Aisha, Aisha. In Sahih Muslim, in the introduction of Sahih Muslim, the Muqaddimah, she said, Umirna an nunazil al-nas manaziluhum. We have been, pro we have been ordered to put people in their proper place. This is the Imam of the Masjid. I'm not going to treat him like he is the um, caretaker of the Masjid. The janitor. This one is my father. I'm not going to treat him like he's my son. This one is a Muslim. I've been commanded, put him in his right place. I'm not going to treat him like he's a Kafir. 
This one right here, this one is my relative. I'm not going to treat him as he's not my relative. That one is my jar, my neighbor. I'm not going to treat him like he's not my jar. That one is from the abnability. I'm not going to treat him like an, an ajnabi. This is a scholar. I'm not going to treat him as a ignorant. And also, this is a khatib. A khatib. I'm not going to make him a scholar. He's given a lesson. He's not a scholar. He graduated from the university. He's not a scholar. A scholar is not this regular people that we're talking about. It's not like that. He has a special place in this religion. And as I told you, one of the reasons uh, the, the religion is fading away, fading away, Allah is told the Prophet says that Allah will not take this knowledge by just snatching it from the people, just like that. But he takes the knowledge by taking away the ulama until he doesn't leave any ulama. So the people ask ignorant people for their issues and those ignorant people will give fatwas and they'll go astray and they'll lead other people astray. We ask Allah Ta'ala by his ism and avam to protect this religion of Al-Islam and to protect it with us and to raise us up on a level that makes us worthy of being the huras of this religion. We ask Allah Ta'ala to protect our children and our wives and to protect the sunnah and to make us all from the ansar of the sunnah and to take out of our hearts any rancor, animosity or enmity towards those companions for verily they are the template and the blueprint for success. The way of the companions is success. The way of the companions. What was the religion doing their day? Should be the religion today. What's not the religion doing their day? Shouldn't be the religion today. Who from amongst you would have a problem with that? Ikhwan Muslimin, the brother from Ikhwan Muslimin. If he told everybody be Ikhwan Muslimin, some of us say yeah, some of us say no. Because we don't agree and some will agree. The one from Jamaat Tabliq say, be Jamaat Tabliq. Some will say yeah, some will say no. The one who's Sufi, some say yeah, some say no. This one say Hezbu Tahrir, some say yeah, some say no. This one over here is intellectual, some say yes, yeah, some say no. This one is Ilmani, some say yes, yeah, some say no. This man comes and says, hey people, let's follow Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. Let's follow them. No one is going to say no, no. Except the Rafida. Always got to be somebody with Benny Adam. Except the Rafida. And we're not from them. We're not from them. But no one who has his aqal is going to say no. So that's the point. Let us leave all of these groups and get back to what those companions were upon. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa ashadu an la ilaha ila ant astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayhi.